Take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. While you're turning there, let me just say that there have been many great inventions created over the years. I mean, just think about it. You've got the wheel, the light bulb, radio, television. In fact, the invention of fast food started with McDonald's. Probably the greatest invention known to man is Sam's Club. It's Sam's Club. I mean, think about it. Sam's Club is the only place in the world where you can get your tires rotated, get your eyes checked, buy a swimming pool, and then buy a vat of sour cream large enough to fill said swimming pool. Who wants one box of mac and cheese? You can have a case of 18 of them bad boys. When I go buy a bottle of ketchup, I want a bottle of ketchup bigger than my dog. Thank you, Hunter. That is my dog. That's how big I want my ketchup. I mean, you know what? God bless America. America's the only place where you can do this. I mean, think about it. I mean, when you pull into the parking lot of Sam's Club, you can hear the eagles screeching. You can hear the national anthem playing off in the distance. There's nothing truly more American. But here's the thing about Sam's Club. In order to go to Sam's Club, you have to be a what? You have to be a member. Have to be a member. Have to have that membership card. If you're a member of Sam's Club, raise your hand. All right, everybody else can leave. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) But Sam's Club is beautiful. It's glorious. It's a wonderful thing. And if the Lord tarries one day, archaeologists... And anthropologists will study the phenomenon that is Sam's Club. But guess what? If you're not a member, you can't shop there. Now, as great as being a member of Sam's Club is, is being a member of the church like being a member of Sam's Club? No, it's not. Me and my family, we have Verizon because we had Verizon in Louisiana and we just kept it. And a few weeks ago when all the AT&T customers went out and man, it's like we're so dependent on our phones now. Like people's lives came to a screeching halt. You know, some of your phone went out. You didn't even know it didn't care. But, you know, our phones didn't go out because we have a subscription to Verizon. Now, let me ask you a question. Is being a member of a church like subscribing to Verizon? No, it's not. Why? Because the church is not a club. The church is not a spiritual service provider. But too many Christians today treat it like it is. We do. A lot of Christians today don't think that church membership is important. Either because they they don't go to a church that often or they're not a member of the church they're attending. It's not important to them. Now, there's 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 a caveat here. There's something I want to say before I go any further. If you're actively looking for a church, okay, you're actively searching for God's will in a church to join. um, I'm not I believe you're taking it seriously. Because it's not a decision to take lightly. It's a serious thing. So if you're actively looking for church to join and you're sincerely seeking out the Lord's spirit, I believe that's a wise thing to do. It's not flipping. It's not like changing a pair of shoes. You don't go join this church over here this month and a couple months you go join this church over here. It's a commitment. So if you're taking the time to search out for church, I think... That's wise. But for too many people, for too many Christians, it's not important to them. Let's go through our Baptist distinctives. Now, I've repeated them every week, and now I'm going to quiz you. You tell me what they are. B stands for what? Well, let's try that again. Uh, B stands for what? Very good. A stands for what? P stands for what? T, the first T stands for what? Two ordinances. I stands for what? Joel Soul Liberty. Very good. Now, do better next week. Next week, I'm going to quiz you again. Some of y'all won't come just for that reason. 
But today we're on S. And S stands for saved membership. Saved membership. Now, in just a minute, we're going to read from Acts chapter 2, but let me set things up here for just a second. Jesus is resurrected from the dead. Jesus has spent the last 40 days with his apostles and his disciples living life with them, resurrected from the grave. The Bible says he's been seen by over 500 people have seen the resurrected Christ. Now he's about to ascend into heaven. He looks at them. He looks at everybody. He gives the great commission. But then he also says, look, in a few days, I want you to wait here in Jerusalem. Because in a few days, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit of God. It's coming. And you need to wait for it. So for the next 10 days, those, those, those disciples of Christ, they gather in an upper room in Jerusalem. 10 days after Jesus ascended into heaven, there was the feast of Pentecost. Penta means 50. Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. During the festival of Pentecost, not only do Jews from all over uh, uh, the nation of Israel come to Jerusalem, but Jews from all the other nations outside Jerusalem, from as far as you can travel in that first century world, they also come to Jerusalem. They're in the upper room, and it's on the day of Pentecost, the first day of the week, that the Holy Spirit pours itself out onto that group of people. It takes the form of cloven tongues of fire. And those cloven tongues of fire come and land on those people and they get the Holy Spirit. They spill out of that upper room into the street. And they begin to preach. And they begin to prophesy. They begin to speak in tongues. This tongues, it's not gibberish. The Bible tells us what the tongues are. They're speaking in their native language, but other people from different countries are hearing the sound of their own native language in their ears. That's what the gift of tongues is. It's giving you the ability. You don't know the other language, but you're supernaturally able to speak that language and able and in order to further the gospel. And then Peter gets up and Peter preaches a message. And oh, what a powerful message it is. We're going to come in Acts 2 and verse 37 as soon as preacher, uh, Peter gets done preaching. So let's read that. Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added 3,000 souls. So it says they were added 3,000 souls. What were they added to? <clears throat> they were added to the church. I want you to think about your Bible for a second. I want you to think about your New Testament. I want you to think about the books, the letters in, these, in your New Testament. These books are letters written by men inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, written to either individuals, local churches, or groups of local churches in a specific region. There's not one book, not one, not one single book in your New Testament that was written to the invisible universal church. Now, it's for the universal church. It's for us. But not one of those books <clears throat> were written to the universal, invisible church. They were all written to individuals or local churches. Think about the book of Romans. Romans was written to the church that was in Rome. 
First and second Corinthians was written to the church that was in Corinth. And there was even a third letter to the Corinthians that we don't have in our Bible. The book of Galatians was written to the churches in the region of Galatia. And, and this is a region, uh, and, and, and actually, uh, this is a region which is south-central Turkey today. F- Ephesians was written to the church in Ephesus. Colossians was written to the church in Colossae. And at the end of the book of Colossians, it says, look, when you get done reading this letter in your church, I want you to go over to Laodicea. And I want you to, to read the letter in their church. And I sent them a letter. When they get done with their letter, I want you to take that letter and bring it over to your church and read it in your church. First and second Thessalonians was written to the church in Thessalonica. And even in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3, in the book of Revelation, it was written to to seven local churches in what today would be known as Western Turkey. I believe that there's a New Testament pattern here. I believe that God cares about the local New Testament church. And I want to ask and answer some questions this morning. What does it mean to be a member of a church? Who can be a member of a church? Why is it important to be a member of a local church? Why can't I just be saved and baptized and then go wherever I want to go? Why do I have to put my name on a roll? Is that even in the Bible? Well, I've got three main questions that I'm going to ask and answer this morning concerning church membership. Question number one, is church membership biblical? Is church membership biblical? I believe yes. I believe church membership is biblical. It's not optional. It's not casual. Too many Christians think it's casual. Too many Christians don't take it seriously. Too many Christians think it's not a big deal. If you're not an official member of a church, unless you're actively trying to find a church, I believe you're in danger. Some people may say that church membership is not in the Bible. You know what I say to you? You know what else is not in the Bible? The Trinity is not in the Bible. I'm talking about the word, not the concept. The word Trinity is not found anywhere in your Bible. You want to know why we believe the Trinity is true? Because we believe this Bible teaches a Trinity. We, we came up with a word to describe something that the Bible teaches. Okay? And I believe it's the same way with church membership. Yes, while the term church membership may not be in Scripture, it's something that the Bible clearly illustrates. Let me give you some scripture this morning. This morning, I want you to see that we are adopted into the family. Galatians 4, 4. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. We are adopted into the family of God. When you are adopted into a family, you have the same rights and privileges that blood-born children have in that family. You are exactly the same. Jesus is the blood relation. We are adopted into his family as co-heirs with him, as brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's why we call ourselves brothers. And that's why we call ourselves sisters, because we are adopted into the same family next we are bought as a possession first corinthians 6 19 or do you not know that your body is a temple of the holy spirit who is in you whom you have from god and that you are not your own for you have been bought with a price therefore glorify god in your body jesus's body on the cross was the payment for our sin 
He purchased us back. He paid for this church. He paid for our salvation. He did that with his body. He did that with his blood. When you take a coupon into a grocery store, what do you do with that coupon? You redeem it. That's what redeem means. Redeem means he bought us back. He purchased us. We are bought with a price. We are his possession. Collectively, we are his possession. Next, we are a branch on a vine. John 15, 4, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit for apart from me, you can do nothing. And anyone, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up and they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. The fruit exists because it is attached to the vine. And if it's not a part of the vine, it will shrivel up, it will die and therefore it will be thrown away. Next, we are part of of the body. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we are all made to drink of one spirit, for the body is not one member, but many. Are, are you seeing it yet? Is it coming together for you? We're adopted into a family. We're bought as a possession. We're the, we're the branches on a vine. We are part of the same body. Then we are a sheep in the flock. John chapter 10, verse 14. I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. Even as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay my life down for the sheep. This is the shepherd who, who, who loves the sheep so much that the shepherd will leave the 99 to go get the one to bring the one back into the fold. And finally, we are bride to the groom. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 Husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all her glory having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that she would be holy and blameless. Listen if, 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 if you don't like my wife, then I probably won't like you that much. Don't, don't try to be buddy-buddy with me and then talk bad about her. Like, if you want to be friends with me, but you're her enemy and you hate her, you can see how that's, that's probably not going to work. So if you want to be friends with me, but you treat her like garbage, guess what? We can't be friends. Does everybody see that? Does everybody get that? Is it possible for us to say to Jesus, Jesus, I love you, but I can't stand your wife. Jesus, I love you. I want to be around you. Me and you are cool, but your bride turns my stomach. I don't want to have anything to do with her. So, you know, I still want to have a relationship with you, but I don't want anything to do with your bride. How do you think that makes Jesus feel? Do you think there's any room in scripture for that? And this is even worse. That's even worse than you having a problem with my wife. Because guess what? I didn't create her. I didn't die for her. I'm not sustaining her. So having a problem with Jesus' bride is even worse. So how can we look God in the eye and say, yes, I want you, but I want nothing to do with your bride. I want nothing to do with what you want for my life. How does that even work? Is this is the phrase church membership in the Bible? No. But I hope I've showed you that there's no room in scripture for you to be a lone ranger Christian. There's no room in scripture for that. A temple has bricks. A flock 
has sheep. A vine has branches. A body has members. And we're expected to know who does and who does not belong in the body. I submit to you today that church membership is biblical. Question number two. How do we become members of the church? Well, number one under that's easy. Salvation. Salvation. Church membership is a privilege bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. You cannot be a part of the body without belonging to it. You cannot be a part of the vine without being connected to the branch. You cannot be attached to the groom without being the bride. The church is not a club. The church is, is it's not a, a service membership. I can't buy my way into the church. I'm born into it. It doesn't work that way. There is a universal church. There is. And we become a part of that universal church from salvation. When we're saved, we become a part of the universal church. Rocky Point Baptist Church is a part of the universal church. And the universal church is, con is, is, is any church that is composed of, of, of Christians saved by grace is a part of the universal church. But then there's a local church. Let's go to Acts 2.41 again. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day were added about 3,000 souls. So they got saved, they received the word, they got saved, and then we see that 3,000 souls were added to what? Some people say, oh, well, they were, that means they were just added to the universal church. Is that true? Is that really what the scripture says? Well, let's look at the very next verse. Acts 2.42. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Okay? Were they going to the universal church every week and listening to the apostles preach and teach? Were they going to the universal church every week to fellowship with their brothers and sisters in Christ? Were they going to the universal church every week to break bread? Were they going to the universal church every week to attend a prayer meeting? No. They weren't doing these things in the universal church. They were doing these things at the local assembly, the ecclesia. That's where these things took place. So first you're saved, and then that brings us to the second way you become a member, and that's through baptism. Through baptism. What did Jesus say? Make disciples and then do what to them? Baptize them in the name of the Father and the name of the Son and the name of the Holy Spirit. Baptism is the first act of obedience after salvation. If you're a believer in here and you have not been baptized, I ask you today, why not? Well, I have a question about baptism. Come ask me. Ask your question. We will answer your question. Baptism is such an important part of the Christian's life. If Jesus thought it was important, then guess what? Me and you should consider it important too. It's nothing to shake a stick at. If you've never been baptized, get that taken care of. If you weren't truly saved until after your first baptism, you need to get scripturally baptized again if you were sprinkled as a child and then later you came to a saving knowledge of baptism i'm sorry but first of all that 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 sprinkling as a child number one that's not full immersion baptism that's what we see in the bible but then number two you you have to get baptized it comes after salvation it comes after regeneration it comes after your conversion there's an order to this you need to get baptized. And guess what? We're not going to judge you for it. Man, we celebrate baptism here. We love baptism. Man, have a baptism on a Sunday in a Baptist church? You can't make us more, more tickled than that. We love baptisms. Come talk to us about it. And then first they were saved. Then they were baptized. And then number three... 
they were added to the number. I want you to notice that after they were saved and baptized, then they were added. What were they added to? Some would say they were added to the roll. The Bible uses the language of the number. The number would be considered like their church roll. In Acts 2.41, it says 3,000 souls were added to their number. Listen, that, that Jerusalem church, it was a really big church. There were a lot of people in it. And guess what? They knew who their members were. They didn't say, well, I'm saved. I'm baptized. That, that, that's good enough. Let's stop there. No, no. They said, I want to stand with this group of believers. Count me among them. Add me to their number. Verse 47. More every day were added to the number. Acts 4.4. 4, the number had, written, had risen to 5,000. And that's just counting them in. In Acts 6, 2, it says that the full number of them came together. And that was, uh, that was, they're having a business meeting there. In the ESV, it says the full number of them came together. In Matthew 18, it tells us uh, that, that the people in the church have the authority to remove someone from the number. And in 1 Corinthians 5, 2, it says you can remove a man from the number under certain conditions. So you can be saved, you can be baptized, but until you're added to the number, you're not a member. Yes, you are a member of the universal church. Listen, you, you may attend any church you want to without officially becoming a member. But if you want to be counted among them, if you are willing to make that commitment then you must say, yes, add me to the number. If we don't know who's who, who's in and who's out, how are we supposed to do things like Hebrews 13, 17 tells us? Obey your leaders and submit to them for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. How am I supposed to know who to watch over? How am I supposed, how are we supposed to know that? Am I supposed to be keeping watch over your soul or not? Are you supposed to be submitting to me as a leader or not? Yes. Upon salvation, you become a member of the universal church. But it's your responsibility as a Christian, as a saved, baptized believer to join a local body of Christ. And it is your responsibility to stand with them. And it's your responsibility to add yourself to their number. Listen, I, please, I don't say this to pick on anyone. I say this because I love you. If I was to cut my finger off and lay it on that table and walk away from it, what would happen to it? It would shrivel up and it would die. But hold on a second. What if I picked the finger up and put it in my pocket? Took it with me everywhere. Take the finger over to the potluck. Man, we having green food today. What if I was to take that finger any way I wanted to go? But you, what would happen to it? It would shrivel up. But wait a minute, I'm taking it with me. Doesn't matter. It's not connected to the body. It has to be connected. Proximity doesn't matter. Listen to me. Commitment makes a difference. Commitment makes a difference. Aren't you glad that Jesus committed himself to you? Aren't you glad for that? Number three. What is the purpose of church membership? What is the purpose of it? Number one. Discipleship. Discipleship. Let me give you some scripture. 1 Peter 2, 2 through 3. Like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. For, uh, 2 Peter 1, 5. Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence knowledge, 
And in your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful and the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 26. And if one member suffers, all members suffer with it. For if one member is honored, all members rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. We are here to build one another up. We're here to encourage one another. We're here to teach one another. If you're a babe in Christ in the church, you know what you need? You need somebody to feed you milk until you're mature enough to eat meat. If you're a mature Christian in here, you've been saved for several years and you know the Bible. And you're a mature Christian. You know you've, you're, you haven't arrived, but you know you're mature than other people. Then you know what you need? You need someone to mentor. The disciplee needs the discipler just as much as the discipler needs the disciplee. As much as that person needs you to disciple them, you need to disciple them as well. We are to guard one another. We are to come together in unity and love and peace and kindness and mercy and harmony. Being a part of a church is to culturally identify as a disciple of Jesus. You say to this world, I follow Christ. I have a family that I belong to. I identify as a Christian. I identify as his disciple. And you can't do any of these things without the local church. You can't do it. Number two. Discipline. Discipline. Matthew 18, 15. We've read this several times in this series. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So the church needs discipleship so we can grow together in Christ. But why does the church need discipline? Because we are humans and we are sinners. And guess what we need? We need guardrails. You need guardrails in your life. You know what they say about locks? Locks aren't for dishonest people. Locks are there to keep honest people honest. Because you can get a ball peen hammer and take care of a lock pretty quick. We need guardrails in our life. And I've said this several times about Matthew 18. I don't like, personally, I don't like calling it church discipline. Because you read that passage and other New Testament passages about church discipline. The goal is not to kick somebody out of the church forever. The goal is not to excommunicate them. No, no. The goal is restoration. We go through these steps not because we hate you. We go through these steps because we love you. And we want you restored. We want you back in your place doing right, doing what you're supposed to do. That's why I like calling it church restoration, because that's the purpose of it. We need discipleship because we need to grow. We need discipline because we need guardrails. Now, what's the third purpose of a church? Glory. Glory. Second Corinthians 318. But we all with unveiled face beholding as a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the spirit. When we gather as a church, it gives us a little taste, just a little foretaste of what heaven is going to be like just the fact of us gathering together, just the fact of us assembling together. This brings glory to God. Being a part of the body, being a member of it 
it changes us. It changes us as we grow and as we get, get sanctified and as we learn more, we begin to change. We believe that church membership is important. If we didn't believe it was important, then we wouldn't promote it. We wouldn't have it as a thing. We would just say, hey, if, just go wherever you want to go. Come one, come all. But I don't think we see that in Scripture. I really don't. Christians in the first century, they were saved, they were baptized, and then they were added to the number. Why? Because they needed to be discipled. They needed discipline in their life. And because church is where you behold the glory of the Lord. Through the process of your sanctification, as you grow from a babe that drinks milk to a mature Christian that eats meat, you are transformed through that process into the same image of Christ until we get to heaven and receive our glorified bodies and are fully sanctified in eternity to come. To be a member of of a local body of saved, baptized believers, to add yourself to their number is to say, I count myself among them. I identify with Christ. I make that commitment. As Jennifer comes and begins to play, I want to say one final word to you. I'm going to give you a second to put your Bibles away. Whether it's this church or not. Listen. It may be another church. That might be surprised to some people. It might not be God's will for you to be a member of this church. And I'm okay with that if it's the Lord's will. I'm not here to browbeat you to join this church. No, 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 no. I just want you to know that's a serious thing. It's a serious thing. Maybe it's not this church. Maybe it's another church. You know where I want you to go? I want you to go where the Holy Spirit leads you to go. Because we are not led by the letter of the law anymore. We are led by the Holy Spirit of God. I want you to be where the Holy Spirit leads you. But it says in Scripture, it is not good for a man to be alone. You are meant for fellowship. You are created for relationship. You are formed for companionship. You are meant to be a part of a whole you are meant to be a member of a body. You were created to be a branch on a vine. You were formed to be a living stone that's part of a temple. You were meant to be people of God's own possession. And you were meant to be sheep in his flock Christ paid for this church with his very blood will you commit to church today every head bowed every eye closed I don't know what you need this morning maybe you are a member of this church maybe you just need to reflect and meditate and thank God for the privilege that you live in a country where you can freely be a member of any church that the Holy Spirit leads you to. Maybe you're in here today and you're searching for a church home. That's good. Because what that tells me is this thing is serious to you. And while selfishly I would want you to join this church, at the end of the day, I don't care about that. What I care about is you obeying the Holy Spirit and you being a member of a church where God wants you to be a member, whether it's here or it's somewhere else.
Let's say today, I'm saved, I'm baptized, but you know what? I'm not going to stop there. I'm going to add myself to the number. And if I'm already added to the number, bless God, I'm going to thank God for the privilege. Because he paid for that privilege with the blood that ran from his veins. Let's pray. Then we'll stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. And we'll have an invitation this morning. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of church membership. Lord, I can count on a few of my hands, Lord. Maybe one hand how many churches I've actually been a member of. Lord, what a privilege it is to be a part of your family. What a privilege it is to be a sheep in the fold, to be part of the flock, to be a branch on the vine. Help us not to take it for granted. Help us to give it the brevity and the importance that it's needed. Lord, whatever we need during this invitation, I pray that you would move and fill us. And I pray we would meditate on the scripture and do business with God this morning. And as always, if there's anybody in here under the sound of my voice that is not saved and doesn't know you as Savior, Lord, they don't know where they're going to go when they die. Lord, they can come to this altar and we'll take a Bible and we'll show them how they can know that they know that they're on their way to heaven. Be with our invitation this morning. In Jesus' name I pray.